From the eternal sea he rises, creating armies on either shore, turning man against his brother, till man exists no more. Book of Revelations predicted it all. That's not a passage from the Bible that you'd ever want spoken to you, is it? But then that's okay, because it's not from the Bible anyway. Welcome to The Omen, a brilliant 1970s satanic horror that rode on the coattails of The Exorcist. And for some reason, it's often compared unfavorably to that film, which I feel is unfair, because it's certainly no copycat. It is, in fact, Hollywood's first attempt at bringing the Bible's Book of Revelation to the big screen. And stories don't come much bigger than that, though the film simply imagines that the beast of the Book of Revelation is the child of Satan, something which is never stated in the source material. Your son, Mr. Thorne, the son of the devil. Ooh. That's enough! And with your wealth and power, he will establish his counterfeit kingdom here on Earth, receiving his power directly from Satan. The screenplay wastes no time setting up its satanic scenario, with little introduction to its two main characters. High-flying U.S. ambassador to Italy, Robert Thorne, is distraught after being told that his wife gave birth to his stillborn child, and he's faced with the grim prospect of giving her that news when she recovers from her unconscious state. The hospital chaplain suggests that he could swap his child for another, a boy whose mother died in childbirth in the same hospital that very night. Against his better judgment, Thorne accepts the opportunity, and unbeknown to he and his wife, they've just adopted the Antichrist as their own child. The concept for The Omen spawned in the mind of producer Harvey Bernhard following a conversation with friend Bob Munger. Bob Munger, a born-again Christian, uh, in a Hollywood uh, restaurant, he said, What if the Antichrist was really alive right now and already walking this planet and he's just a little kid? I dropped the food, I walked out of the restaurant, I, I wrote 10 pages, I called David Seltzer, there was a, a writer strike on at the time. I must have researched probably for three months before I really set anything down on paper. The Bible said that the, that, that the unholy one will, will rise from the um, eternal sea. And then in an interpretive text, I saw that the, inter the eternal sea had been interpreted by theologians as the world of revolution and turmoil. So the devil's child will rise from the world of politics. But the project needed a talented director, and in Richard Donner they found just that. The Omen changed my life. The Omen, you know, opened up my career. I, I, before that I had done a lot of television. Donner had done the TV rounds on shows such as Cannon, The Streets of San Francisco, and Kojak before he was offered the chance to direct The Omen. And his confident direction on that film would open the door to Superman, Lethal Weapon, and Scrooge in the future. He would also work with Omen producer Harry Bernhard again as an executive producer on 1987's The Lost Boys. Casting is just the start of a long list of strengths in this film. Seasoned actor Gregory Peck was first choice as Robert Thorne, and he was eager for the part. But there was resistance from the studio because of some of the characters' actions in the screenplay. Please, Daddy, no! No, Daddy, no! God, help me! Other actors considered for the role would be Oliver Reed, Charles Bronson, and bizarrely, the all-singing and all-dancing Dick Van Dyke. Fortunately, Peck was given the part he craved, and he would head a stellar cast. I had uh, Billy Whitelaw, I had David Warner, I had Lee Remick. The Antichrist himself would be far more difficult to cast, though, and would involve auditioning over 500 boys for the dubious honor of playing that role. Harvey came in, little Harvey, and Dick says... When I yell action, you attack me, and don't stop till I yell cut. Dick yells action, the guy hits him right in the balls. He hits him right in the, he just, tiger, hit him right in the nuts, boom, 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 boom. He, he was a good kid, I, I would not have wanted him to be my own. The scariest scene for me was the dog attack in the graveyard. And it's a scene where the stuntman playing David Warner would be badly injured, despite wearing metal and leather armor under his clothes. The one dog cut right through the armor, cut through the uh, leather, and had 14 stitches. They weren't bar They weren't angry. They were trying to hump each other. I mean, I, there's shots in there. If you really look closely, there's a couple of dogs up on top with glazed eyes, and and but we just put sounds in of dogs barking. But the scariest scene for the cast was the baboon scene at Windsor Safari Park, especially for Lee Remick. Keep all car windows closed. Baboons are dangerous. Donna had tried every trick in the book to get the baboons to attack the car that Remick was driving, to no avail. 
After being advised that the alpha male of the troop was to undergo a minor operation, they thought it a good idea to place the still unconscious baboon in the car with Remick and make him visible to his surrounding troop. What they didn't count on was the baboon in the car waking up. The baboons are really coming at the car. Coming at the car. And, and Lee goes to scream. I said, no, no, Lee, not yet. And she said, ah, it's not yet, not yet. And I looked down, and the baboon is coming too. And he's got a hold of her hair. And he's pulling her back. And these baboons are stronger than 10 of us. Lee was totally, I mean, we had to change her wardrobe three times. The kid was horrified. I mean, total state of panic. I mean, it was, it was, it, I mean, if you notice that scene, there's a lot of shaking out there, and that's me, because I was scared stiff. But no matter how scary or touching the scene, it was always Jerry Goldsmith's memorable score elevating it to new heights. Goldsmith was one of the great movie composers of his time, responsible for Planet of the Apes, Chinatown, and one of my personal favorites, Poltergeist. And then I started thinking about it, the demon demonic uh, nature of the film. When he said to me, I, 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 I would like to do something like Gregorian chants, I see, I hear a choral group. Uh, I figured, oh, okay, I gotta hear this. Jerry Goldsmith's score, I think, probably kicked the movie over the top. Jerry got up there, and all of a sudden, this group and this guttural deep breathing started to do. Antichristo, Antichristo, Antichristo. And I got the shivers, I mean, the hair came up on the back of my neck. But Oscars for horror films were a rarity, and Goldsmith was experienced enough to know that despite his nomination for The Omen, the chances of him winning the Oscar were next to zero. Yeah, I'm an expert at losing. Um, the novice at winning, uh, I think I, I think that the woman at that time was in like 10th or 11th nomination. And I think it's a crying shame that Jerry Goldsmith would never win an Oscar for any of his countless scores for films, except for The Omen. Jerry Goldsmith for The Omen. <laughs> And the Piper's dream did come true, dear Carol. Thank you. And what of the famous omen curse that haunted its production? Well, it did at least prove that lightning can strike twice. Pex plane was coming over, a TWA flight that was a direct flight from L.A. Everybody was always on. It got hit by lightning. Three days later, David Seltzer was on the same flight. His plane was hit by lightning. Uh, we shot a sequence with lions that never made the, the screen. The, the guard was, was in the, his little booth, I guess left his door open. Two lions came in, attacked him and killed him. That day. It's our, our special effects man. He had a beautiful girlfriend. He was driving and had a head-on accident and beheaded this girl. And he, John is the one that be, he had invented the beheading of our picture, and so his girl was beheaded, and then he woke up and he saw Liège, 6.6 6 kilometers. That was, that was frightening. The Omen needs no comparison with any other film. It stands in its own right as a brilliant attempt at bringing one of the biggest stories of Western culture to the big screen. You've been watching episode three of a series on satanic horror films, which also includes The Exorcist, Angel Heart, Sleepy Hollow, and The Devil Rides Out.